All right, good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. Um, so today's topic is going to be a, a synchronization among multiple processes. But before we get started, I just wanted to um, remind everybody of a few important things coming up since we're about to finish up the term. So the first thing is hopefully you're all very much aware that all of the labs uh, in 6004 must be completed um, and passed and checked off in order to pass this class. So you have until the end of the day on Friday to get um, all of your labs uh, checked off. That does not include the design project, which is optional, but if you're doing any of the design project, then you also must have that complete by Friday. You cannot use any late days beyond Friday, okay? Um, we're going to have two lectures this week and one more next week, and then we'll have the last quiz during finals week on Thursday, December 20th, and I've put here the time and um, the rooms. Most of you should come to 10 to 50 unless we send you um, an email uh, stating otherwise. And the last thing is that uh, evaluations for the course have opened and we really, really um, pay very close attention to the evaluations and to your comments. So please take the time uh, to evaluate the course and give us uh, constructive um, feedback on how we can make it better for next time. All right, any questions before we get started? Okay. So, so far we've, we've learned about how we can run multiple processes on the same CPU where our operating system was in charge of um, uh, switching from one process to another via time sharing, okay? And you can imagine, however, that even within a single process, you might want to further subdivide that process into multiple computation threads, which may or may not be able to be executed in parallel. And so, especially as um, technology has evolved, especially in the uh, last decade or so, we've moved to the world where instead of continuing to improve upon our uh, single processor CPUs, we have uh, started to implement multi-core uh, CPUs. So we have multiple cores sitting on the same chip and we want to make use of them. And so what we want to do is, if possible, we want to try to execute instructions in parallel. And so, yeah? What's a core? A core is the main uh, processing component of your CPU, so you can imagine that it's not the entire CPU in that they might be sharing memories and things like that, um, but it's uh, the main processing portions of it. So you can imagine that you could do, you know, two add operations if you had two cores rather than just one. Okay? Any other questions? Yes? Uh, is there still one register file? Uh, each core could have its own register file. Okay? All right, so, um, so now, uh, when we have these multiple threads of execution, there's um, two different uh, types of threads that we might have. We might have, you know, some multiple independent threads where um, the only thing that they're competing for is some kind of shared resource, in which case, for the most part, they can operate, um, they might be able to operate in parallel unless they actually need to be using that shared resource at that particular point in time. And, um, alternatively, we can have multiple cooperating uh, threads. So the idea here is that they would be communicating data information to each other and, and they're trying to actually solve a larger problem together, okay? So in the case where um, we have to have the threads communicate with each other, we have two alternatives of how they can do this communication. Um, the first is what we called shared memory. And so in this model, they, um, the multiple threads are using the same address space, and so in order to communicate with each other, all they have to do is store to a particular location in memory, and then the other thread can read from that same location in memory. Um, alternatively, 
we can have a message passing um, mechanism for sharing information. And here, the idea is that now the address space is different. And so uh, in order to communicate from one thread to another, you actually have to send explicit messages. So when we think about you know, the pros and cons of these two, um, the implementation in a shared memory uh, system is very simple. All we're doing is just loads and stores, which we're very familiar with doing. The problem with it, however, is that the different threads, you know, have the potential of um, stepping on each other's toes if you're not careful. Okay, in um, the message passing system, you don't have the issue of uh, stepping on each other's toes, but there's a lot more overhead. And so today, we're actually going to focus on the shared memory model, but we're going to talk about how can we make sure that we have synchronization between our different threads so that they don't step on each other's toes. All right, so whenever you're doing things in parallel, um, you're probably going to need to do some form of synchronization. And there can be multiple reasons for why you might need to do the synchronization. So, for example, suppose that you have you know, a process that wants to fork off a bunch of parallel uh, threads. And then, before continuing, it needs to make sure that all of those individual threads completed uh, the task that they were assigned to do. Okay, So this is what we call uh, fork and join. And so we have to have some kind of synchronization that allows you know, us to know when it is that all of those uh, processes that were operating in parallel finished their task. Another example um, that's very popular is the producer-consumer. So the way that this, uh, th this works is basically you have um, two threads, one that's producing something which the other one needs to consume, and then the other one which is consuming what it is that the first one produced. So clearly, just based on um, uh, the names, it, you know, there's a dependency between the two where the consumer can't consume something until the producer has produced it. And so once again, um, you'll have to uh, have some kind of synchronization between the two. And then the last that we want to talk about is mutual exclusion. And so when you have shared resources, it's um, potentially the case that you're not going to be able to execute two things at the same time. And so we need to have a way of specifying uh, which one of the threads gets to have access to that shared user, uh, to that shared resource, so that the, um, uh, at any given point in time, um, only they're using that resource and, and no other thread. All right, so what does it mean to be thread safe? Well, you can think of uh, multi-threaded programs as if it's running on a single processor, okay? If it was running on a single processor, then basically our operating system would be responsible for time sharing between the different threads, and you would expect a particular um, output to be uh, produced by this uh, unit processor. Well, a um, thread, when we talk about thread safe programming, we say that even if we have multiple processes operating in parallel, we expect that the output of the program is going to be exactly the same as if you were executing it on a unit processor. All right. So for the rest of today's lecture, we'll, we're going to assume that we actually have multiple units that can operate in parallel. And we're going to talk about how do we do synchronization uh, between these two and why, um, uh, why we might need that. All right. So here what we've got is you know, a producer and consumer, which is the um, very common uh, problem that we have. And we see that each thread on its own has a sequence of instructions that it's going to execute. So the producer is going to execute some instructions, which we'll call you know, x. And after it executes those instructions, it's produced a character, which it's going to store into the variable c. And then it's going to send that character to the consumer. The consumer is going to receive this character C, and then it's going to use it in order to execute some sequence of instructions Y. So within each of these threads, we see that you know first we execute the first set of instructions X to produce the first character, and then we send that character. Then we execute you know the X instructions once again to produce a second character, and we send that character, and so on. Meaning that we execute each of the instructions um, is sequentially in order. Similarly for the consumer, but 
at the moment, we don't have anything that's telling us what's the um, uh, what's the relative ordering of the instructions across these two threads, all right? So in order for things to work correctly, we need to be able to specify constraints across these threads. So specifically, we're going to use this um, sort of uh, rounded uh, less than sign to indicate precedence, all right? And so this says that it's, we need A to precede B. So let's think about, you know, what are the precedence constraints for this producer-consumer um, uh, model that we have right here? Can anybody think of, you know, what we need to have be true? Yeah. The producer needs to produce something for the consumer to consume. Exactly. Okay. So we basically need to make sure that we're not trying to consume before we've produced it. And so that's indicated with these uh, red arrows. And or we can say basically that send of I must precede receive of I. Okay. Pretty clear. Do we have um, any other constraints that we see here? Send I will happen before send I plus one because we know that within a thread instructions are executed sequentially. But you're close. Yeah? Exactly. Okay? So because we're using a single variable C in order to communicate between these two threads, we need to make sure that our consumer has consumed the previous value that I produced and put into my variable C before I overwrite it with something new. Okay? And so we have both of those uh, precedence constraints to, uh, to worry about between these threads. Now, we can make the precedent constraint be a little more relaxed if instead of using a single character um, or a single memory location to communicate between these two threads, we use a buffer of size n. Okay, so if I have a buffer of size n, what this allows me to do is that my producer can get up to n characters ahead of my consumer. Right? Does everybody see that? Great. So um, now, instead of having to have, you know, uh, receive of I uh, proceed send of I, it can, it, you just, uh, it can go up to proceed of, <laughs> sorry, receive of I needs to proceed send of I plus N. Okay? So the way that we typically implement this um, is what's in what's called a ring buffer. So let's say that we have a buffer that can hold up to three characters. And initially this buffer is empty, and both our consumer and producer are pointing to the first location in this buffer. Okay? So first thing that has to happen is we have to produce something, right? So our producer is going to run, and let's say it produces a character C0, it puts us into the buffer. Now, one of two things can happen. Either the consumer can consume that character, or because I still have space in my buffer, the producer could produce something else. And so in this example, the producer produces another character, we put that into my buffer, and then it produces a third character. Now I've gotten to the point where my buffer is full. Okay, so if I cannot have the producer run again before the consumer runs at least once. And so the next thing that happens in our timeline is that the consumer goes ahead and reads the C0, which was the first character that was written, okay? And then we proceed in this manner, where now it reads C1. At this point, we have two uh, freed up locations in our buffer. And so now the producer can go back to writing again. And you'll notice that what we mean by a ring buffer is that once you fall off the end, you just go back to the beginning. And so the next time that you write a new character, it's going to go into that location zero of your buffer. OK? All right. So. Let's take a look at how we would go about implementing uh, the synchronization requirements between our producer and consumer using a shared memory model where the variables that are shared between these two threads are our, N, um, our buffer of size n and our pointers in and out. So in is pointing to where the producer is going to put something into the buffer and out is pointing to where the consumer is going to read something from the buffer. Okay, so 
our code, I know this is uh, C, but hopefully uh, most of you can figure out um, what this relatively simple code is trying to do. And essentially what it's doing is the producer is running a send routine which is going to take the character that it wants to send, it's going to put it into the buffer in the location indexed by in, and then it's going to increment in by one mod n so that it can wrap around back to the beginning when it uh, falls off the end. Similarly, the consumer is going to read a character from the buffer at location out, it's going to then increment out mod n, and it's going to return that character. Okay, so does this code work as it is? No. Good. So, why doesn't it work? Yep. Uh, send overrides what it's... If, you, if, if send has run more than n times, it overrides its... its uh, it overrides the buffer. Sure. And even before that, you know, it's possible that the consumer is going to run in this case before I've ever produced anything. Right? So let's try to figure out how do we solve this. So we introduce a new data structure called semaphores. Semaphores are um, basically, uh, it's an integer that's a value that's greater than or equal to zero. And we have two operations that can work on these semaphores. The first is um, a wait for a semaphore. So what happens with wait is it basically makes the thread wait until the semaphore value is greater than zero. Once it's greater than zero, then it's going to decrement that semaphore value by one, and it's going to now proceed with the instructions that follow that wait operation. Okay? The other instruction that we use with semaphores is signal. So when we're done with some point of synchronization or using a shared resource or something like that, we're going to signal the semaphore, which is going to make the value of the semaphore be incremented by one. So now somebody that's waiting on the semaphore um, can start running. So <clears throat> the semantic guarantee that we have is that if we initialize our semaphore to a value k, we are ensuring that send, uh, that signal of i is not is going to proceed. Sig uh, sorry, signal of i is going to proceed weight of i plus k. Okay, so let's take a look at how we can go ahead and use that in our producer um, uh, consumer. But so, just to you know, make sure we're all on the same page, we're going to start with a very you know, simple example where what we want to do is we want to use semaphores in order to establish some order of precedence between these two threads A and B. Okay? So A consists of five instructions, A1 through A5, and we know that within thread A, their instructions are going to be executed in order. Similarly, B consists of five instructions, B1 through B5, and those are going to be executed in order. But we want to add an additional constraint that says that A2 should precede B4 in this example. Okay? So how would we go about doing that? Well, the first thing we do is we define a semaphore. Okay? And so our semaphore is going to be initialized to zero. And we have this arrow here which is indicating that precedence constraint. It's saying basically I need to complete A2 before I run B4. And so how do I make use of this um, semaphore that I just defined? Um, it's relatively simple. Basically at the beginning of my arrow, I have a signal S. So as soon as A2 is done, I can now signal that um, B4 can go ahead and start running. So I use that by signaling the semaphore S. And similarly, on the other end of my arrow, I have a wait for S. So B4 will not run until a semaphore S has been signaled. OK? Any questions about that? Yeah? So when, when we use signal, and there is potentially like n threads running, does it allow them to compete to get a hold of that, that process? Yes. OK. So is this equivalent to like blocking and notifying in, in other programming languages? Uh, similar. I mean, so yeah. And then just one of them, though, is going to actually get access to that semaphore. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the details of that in a moment. Any other questions? OK, great. So 
Another um, uh, way that we can use semaphores is to deal with resource allocation, right? So we said that sometimes we have, you know, a limited number of resources that must might must be used amongst a number of threads. And so what we can do in order to uh, to deal with that is to also define a semaphore. This time, instead of initializing it to zero and signaling when you know a particular uh, situation has occurred, what we're going to do is we're going to initialize it to the number of resources that we have. So the number of resources in this example is k. And so now any process that needs this resource is first going to wait on that semaphore. So as long as we have resources available, the wait is going to succeed and it's going to reduce the value of the semaphore by one. As soon as we have used up all of our resources, then the semaphore value is going to be zero. And so then the next thread that asks for the semaphore is not going to be able to get it until one of the other threads signals the semaphore S because it's now done using that resource. And so once again, we have a resource available for our use. All right. so. Let's try to use these concepts in order to fix our um, producer-consumer problem here with our size n buffer, okay? So we're going to introduce a semaphore, which we call characters. And initially, we have zero characters, okay? So in order to specify that I want my producer to produce something before my consumer consumes it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to signal characters at the end of the producer's uh, sequence of code. So once it's produced a character, it's going to signal characters, which is going to increment the value of the semaphore by one. Similarly, on the consumer side, it's not going to run until it gets a hold of the semaphore characters, right? So initially, the character's semaphore is equal to zero. It's not going to be equal to one until the producer has produced something, and now the consumer can go ahead and, um, and run with it. So this is going to take care of uh, which precedent constraint that we were talking about. Just that send has to occur before receive. And we also have, you know, a buffer of size n. And um, that's going to control, you know, how many elements we can put into our buffer. But, you know, what's still not right about this code? Yep. So I could, you know, produce more than n values before my consumer has uh, begun to consume anything, okay? So we need a little bit more synchronization before our code is going to work correctly, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to introduce another semaphore, okay? This semaphore is going to be called spaces. So not only do we want to indicate how many characters the producer has put into the buffer, we also want to know how many spaces do we have left in our buffer so that the producer doesn't overflow the buffer. Okay, so initially when our buffer is empty, we have n spaces in the buffer. So we initialize our spaces semaphore to n. And now, before the producer runs, it first has to make sure that there's actually space in the buffer. Okay? So if there's space in the buffer, then it can go ahead and execute. If there isn't, then it's just not going to be allowed to run. And so that's going to prevent overflowing of the buffer before the consumer uh, consumes at least one of the characters in the buffer. So we start off the producer by waiting for space. Once it has space in the buffer, it's going to put a value into the buffer at location in, increment in, and then signal characters. And now our consumer is going to wait for characters. So once it's signaled that there is a character available, then the consumer can start running. It's going to read from location out in the buffer. And when it's done, it's going to say, oh, now there's an extra space available because I'm done um, processing this particular character. Okay? Any questions about this?
So you'll notice that there is in parentheses at the top of the slide this caveat which says that this is going to work, but it's only going to work for a single producer and a single consumer. So who, let, we're going to you know, try to understand why, what can go wrong if I have multiple producers or multiple consumers. Okay? Now in order to understand that, we're going to shift gears for a second and we're going to take a look at the following problem. So suppose that I have two users that want to take some money out of an account. Okay? And so let's say you know, I have two ATMs, my account is 6004, and each one of these users wants to take $50 out of the account. All right. So I have this function called debit, which is basically going to look at the balance in the account. It's going to decrement it by the amount I'm taking out, and then it's going to update that balance accordingly. Right. So when I have these two users each trying to get $50 out of the account, what's supposed to happen? Well, the first thread comes in and assuming that T0 has the address of this balance of account, it's going to load that balance value into a register. It's going to decrement it by A1, which is the amount that I'm taking out from the ATM. And then it's going to store that updated balance um, back into the memory location that's holding the balance. Okay, and so suppose I had, you know, $150 initially in my account, my thread one comes along, it takes out $50, and now it updates the balance to be 100, then thread two comes along, and it sees that the balance is now 100, it takes 50 out, and we end up with a balance of 50, and each one of the users got $50, okay? so. What we expected is that the balance was going to drop by $100 and that, you know, we now have $100 in cash amongst the two users. But imagine that instead of being executed in the order that I just showed you, the instructions between the two threads were interleaved. Okay? So let's take a closer look at what's going to happen in this situation. So what happens here is suppose that thread one starts, you know, and it's going to read the balance that's currently in my account. And in our example, we said that's 150. Well, it's possible that the way, the order in which these instructions are going to be executed is such that thread two will then execute its first instruction. And so it too is going to read that the balance of the account is 150. Okay, so now each one of the users is going to get their $50 out, but what am I going to actually update my balance to at the end of this, of these two threads? Is it going to be 50 like I expected? It'll be 100, right? So I took $100 out, but I only decremented my, um, my balance by $50, okay? Clearly, this is not how we want our ATMs to work or we're going to have lots of problems, okay? So um, what we want to do here is we want to introduce a new notion, which is a notion of what's called a critical section, okay? So the concept here is that it's um, the, the three instructions that correspond to the load, subtract, and store all have to happen atomically. There's nothing that can come in between them, um, otherwise I might end up with a, um, with a wrong value. And so what we, um, what we use for this is a constraint called mutual exclusion, which basically says, you know, I define a critical section of my code, and when I'm in this critical section, exactly one of the threads can be in it, okay? And so we're going to see how we're going to use that in our producer-consumer example in just a second. So if we, go, um, if we now go back to our ATM example and we want to fix it using this, um, uh, this special mutual exclusion, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, define a new kind of semaphore where the precedence constraint that we need to satisfy is that either A precedes B or B precedes A. Okay? We don't care about the order of which thread goes first, but only one of them can go at a time. Okay, so how do we do that? We basically have another semaphore, and this semaphore is initialized to the value 1. Okay, and so what this is saying that is that exactly one of my threads can get 
access to this lock value um, one, okay? And so both of my threads at the beginning of the code are going to sit there and they're gonna wait on lock. Only one of the threads is going to succeed in actually getting that lock. And so at that point, it makes the lock equal to zero. And so the other thread cannot get access to that lock and it cannot be executing the same sequence of instructions until the first thread that got the lock is done. So when the first thread is complete, then it signals lock. And now, at this point, it's safe for the second thread to go ahead and, um, and, and uh, have access to the account, okay? And so, as long as we use this additional uh, synchronization uh, lock, we're going to ensure that even if two different users are trying to take money out of that account at the same time, that, that it'll happen in such a way that the critical section is not interrupted so that you'll make sure that when the second guy goes to read the value of the account, it actually sees the updated value, which is already deducted uh, the $50. Yes? Can we make sure that the both ones, like A and B, they don't both read the lock at the same time? And like they both see it, even though like, like in the previous example where it loaded it, and then it switched to the other thread, and then it loaded the same value? Yeah. So, um, so this is actually a difficult problem to solve. And so, in fact, um, if you think about it, you, you kind of need semaphores in order to make sure that I, you know, check this lock and update it at the same time, right? And so, in a moment, we'll get to how it's actually uh, uh, done, but it, you know, this is, it's not a, a, a trivial answer. Okay, so just before we get to that, um, one other you know, comment that I wanted to make is to think about you know, if we're going to have these locks, we also need to think about you know, what should be the granularity of this lock, right? So if I have you know, a lock for every single account, that might introduce you know, a tremendous amount of overhead you know, on my banking system. On the other hand, if I have you know, a single lock for the entire banking system, then that means you know, I can only access one account at a time, which would be too prohibitive, right? And so we might have you know, some kind of middle ground where you know, maybe you say that all of the accounts that end in 004 you know, have to share a single lock. And so you wouldn't be able to have two accounts that end in 004 get the lock at the same time, but at least I could have an account that's 004 and another one that's 003 accessing their accounts at the same time. All right, so back to our um, producer-consumer problem, right? So now, what we said was the problem is that we had solved things for the situation where we had a single producer and a single consumer, okay? So now we're gonna augment our problem. We're gonna think about, well, what happens if I have multiple producers or consumers? And so in this example here, we have two producers, right? So just to highlight, you know, what the problem was, if the instructions are, were to be executed in this interleaved manner shown here, then what's going to happen is that both producer one and producer two are going to try to write their character into the same location in the buffer, okay? Not what we want, right? We want to make sure that one of them is writing into it and then immediately incrementing the pointer to point to the next location before the other process uh, you know, reads the value of, of in. So how do we do this? We're going to use this new lock uh, mutual exclusion semaphore that we just introduced. And so we're going to define the semaphore. We're going to have lock uh, initialized to one. And we're going to have this critical section, which is you know, reading or writing to the buffer and incrementing the pointer live within um, uh, the accessing and, and giving up of that lock, okay? So at any point in time, only one producer or one consumer can be executing uh, the, the sequence of instructions and so only one of them can be making the pointer change, meaning that it's going to be impossible for two producers to now write to the same location in my buffer. Similarly, it'll be impossible for two consumers to read from the same location. Okay? Does everybody see that? <laughs> 
Good. All right. So basically, we've now, you know, added enough semaphores to ensure that all of our constraints are satisfied in a system where we have even multiple con producers and multiple consumers, okay? So we had the, um, the spaces semaphore, which made sure that we didn't overrun our buffer. We had the characters semaphore to make sure that we produce something before we consumed it. And we have the lock semaphore, which takes care of this mutual ex uh, exclusion uh, requirement in the critical section of our code. All right. <clears throat> so. This is pretty cool, you know, we have a single uh, uh, primitive that took care of all of these issues, right? So we were able to deal with both precedence constraints using our semaphores as well as the mutual exclusion. So now let's get to your question of how do we go about implementing these semaphores? And so um, the most common way that uh, these are implemented is that we actually augment our instruction set architecture to have a special instruction which is called a test and set instruction. Okay, so because a single instruction is atomic by definition, then what's going to happen is that you're going to be able to both look at the value of a memory location and update it within the single instruction. Okay, and so, you know, uh, these test and set instructions aren't, um, they're typically uh, very simple, right? So like they might test is something equal to zero and, you know, and if it is, then set it to one all within a single instruction, right? But the idea is that um, if you're executing this instruction, at any point in time, you have exactly one process that's executing it. And so even if you have two processes that are, or two threads that are waiting on the same lock, only one of them is going to be able to get it because it gets it atomically. Okay? All right. Oops, I should have, uh, <laughs> sorry, shown that. Okay, so this is the most common approach, which is to augment our instruction set architecture with this new type of instruction. And if you look at um, the details of the RISC-V architecture, it has uh, such instructions um, for this exact purpose. An alternative to this, which is less popular and it's also much more constrained, is if you're dealing with um, a uniprocessor where your kernel, just in, in, like when we first ta started talking about operating systems, we talked about um, a uniprocessor with a kernel that could not be interrupted. If you have uh, such a system, then what you could do is implement your um, semaphores using a system call. Right? So what happens when you do a system call? When you do a system call, you enter kernel mode. If you enter kernel mode and your kernel mode is uninterruptible, then by definition, nobody else is going to be able to come and execute anything else during that time. And so you guarantee atomicity by um, executing your signal and lock instructions as a system call. Okay, but the more common is what I mentioned earlier, which is this uh, test and set instruction. Okay, so we're almost there, but there's still some problems, all right? So we introduced these semaphores, which are allowing us to uh, deal with these synchronization issues, but let's, you know, now go back to our ATM example, and let's suppose that I want to write a function that allows me to transfer money from one account to another, okay? And let's suppose that I have two users, and the first one is trying to transfer money from 6031 to the 6004 account, and my other user is trying to transfer from 6004 to 6031, okay? So what does my transfer function look like? Well, now because I'm dealing with two accounts, I have to access two locks, right? So I'm going to, you know, try to get the lock for account one, also try to get the lock for account two, then I'm going to update the balance for both of those accounts, and then I'm going to release those locks. So. Does anybody see something that might be a problem here? Yes? So what could happen is 
Then when everyone goes back, they're trying to take the lock of the double four, but that's already held by double four. And then double four, they take the um, second lock, so that's already held by double three one. And then they just stop. That's exactly right. Okay, so uh, this is basically just summarizing that. So you can imagine that the first thing that happens is thread one, you know, first asks for the 6031 lock and it gets it. Thread two first asks for the 6004 lock and it gets it. Now thread one comes along and it wants the 6004 lock. Well, it can sit there and wait all day long because it's never going to get it because the other guy already has it right? And the other guy's never going to release it because it's sitting there and waiting for the 6031 lock, which it's never going to get. So what we call this situation is deadlock, where neither one of the processes is going to be able to make any forward progress. Bad situation, which we want to avoid at all costs, okay? So let's take a little bit of a closer look at this problem. So there's a very famous um, a uh, problem known as the diners philosophers problem and um, and it goes like this so imagine that you have a bunch of uh, philosophers that are sitting around a round table and they're about to you know be fed some delicious food and between each of them uh, sits one chopstick and they're all, you know, very uh, polite and they follow a very specific algorithm in order to be able to eat. And this algorithm basically says that first they pick up the chopstick on their left, then they pick up the chopstick on their right, and once they have both chopsticks they can eat, and once they're done eating they put the chopsticks back. Okay? So, what can happen in this problem? deadlock, right? Each one of these philosophers could grab, you know, their left chopstick and now none of them can grab the right chopstick, right? So how do we solve this problem? So first, before we try to solve it, let's try to, you know, make sure that we understand the various um, uh, conditions which caused us to get into this deadlock condition in the first place, right? So the first is mutual exclusion which is that only one thread can have you know, a given chopstick at any point in time, right? So I can't give the same uh, chopstick to multiple threads, okay? The second is that I'm using what's called the hold and wait model. So once I get a chopstick, I sit there and I hold it until you know, I'm ready to be able to use it. So I'm not going to give it up even though I might not have my other chopstick. The third issue is that we have no preemption, which means that once I got my chopstick, nobody can take it away from me. Okay? And then uh, finally, the last idea is that we're basically entering this circular wait, where each guy is waiting for the other guy to release their chopstick, and uh, the same thing is happening to all of them, and so none of them are going to release it, and so we have deadlock. So how do we deal with this? There's two possible ways of dealing with it. The first is to try to avoid it in the first place. And the second is to actually identify that it happened and then execute some sequence of operations in order to recover from it. So let's think about how we can avoid it in the first place. So imagine that you know we have the same diners philosophers problem, but now we're going to give them a different algorithm for how to pick up their chopsticks. Okay, so we're going to number each one of these chopsticks or each one of these um, resources, and the new algorithm that the philosophers are going to use is that they're first going to take the low uh, numbered uh, chopstick, then they're going to take the high numbered chopstick, then if they have both chopsticks they get to eat and when they're done they put the chopsticks down. So if they follow this algorithm are we going to end up in deadlock? I see shaking of head. No, that's correct. Why not? Yeah? Because five would be the first step so one of the philosophers looks like they would get like four five mm -hmm. and then two and five and then they would eat and then 
That's exactly right. So the one that you know has the highest number, uh, chopstick will be able to eat by definition, and so by definition you don't have deadlock. Okay. So what this problem is trying to um, uh, to to make us realize is that if we're careful about um, how we assign the locks for our specific shared resources, then we can try to avoid deadlock. So if we go back to our ATM example, right, where we had two accounts, what might we be able to do with these two accounts in order to avoid the deadlock problem that we had before, where one guy, you know, got the lock for one of the accounts and the other guy got the lock for the other accounts and now we're just stuck? What could I do instead? Yep? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So suppose, you know, that I added these two instructions, which basically say, you know, A is the minimum of the accounts and B is the maximum of the accounts. And so you're always going to try to access the minimum one first. And so both of them are going to try to access now the 6004 account before they try to access the 6031 account. And so we won't end up in the situation that we had before where one of them gets one lock and the other gets the other lock and they're just stuck. Okay? And so um, that's basically it for today where, uh, you know, what we want to, you know, what we want to get from today's lecture is that we can execute multiple things in parallel, but the minute that we start to execute things in parallel, then we have to worry about synchronization and making sure that our threads are not stepping on each other's toes. And the way that we do that is using these semaphores, which can deal with precedence constraints, with resource constraints, and with mutual exclusion. And then the last thing you have to worry about, of course, is to be careful about how you assign these resources so that you don't end up with deadlock. All right. Thanks, everybody. See you next time.